10 years ago, I infiltrated a tech startup. When I say infiltrate, I mean I got a job at one. But while I was doing my job, I was also treating it like my personal ethnographic field research site. You see, I was trained as an anthropologist, and anthropologists practice something called participant observation, where we immerse ourselves fully in a culture and we try to decode it at the same time. I decided to try and decode startup culture and office culture in general. Now to confess, I had never gone to an office every day. I had a job, I was a writer, and before that I was an academic, but I'd never physically gone to the office every day. And I realized, surprisingly, that it was nothing like how I had imagined. I don't know what I thought I was gonna expect. But the first thing that was really surprising is, Maybe some of you work in industries where there is a gender balance in the workplace, but tech is not one of those industries. I was often the only woman in a room. I was the only woman on the board. I was the only woman on the exec team. And whenever I went to an investment pitch or a tech conference, I was really in the minority. And I realized this is an experience that many of us have. You know, we're in university with a sort of equal distribution of men and women. We have female and male mentors and teachers. And then suddenly, we show up at work, and it's like we're marooned on an island of men. And the funny thing is, no one tells us to expect this. It's not like they hand you your diploma and then like a little handbook that says, oh, by the way, everything's about to be different. The second thing that I found really shocking is the language that people used in the workplace. People, especially investors, talked to me in a way that I was completely unfamiliar with. They used a lot of sports metaphors. They said like, let's move the goalpost, let's kick the ball, let's follow the ball, shots on goal, boil the ocean. Have you heard that one? Some of it was overtly sexist. Have you heard, let's open the full kimono? Or how about this one? they're already pregnant, they may as well have the baby. If you don't know what that means, don't ask me. It's been 10 years, I have no idea. I found this language deeply alienating, and I was reminded of the early anthropologists that I had studied who would show up in remote places and have to adapt to a totally foreign culture and language. And yet this was the workplace, the most ubiquitous of social and cultural spaces. I was supposed to know what to do. I realized at that moment that the workplace was not made for me. The workplace is an all-male space that has allowed a few women to enter, but only if we adhere to the old rules, the old norms, the old language, the old metaphors about balls. It's so surprising, actually, and ironic, because Technology is supposed to be at the forefront of change. We're disrupting everything. We're going to the moon. We are changing the way we interact with our loved ones. Technology is part of our everyday and most intimate lives. And yet, technology fails to disrupt and sometimes even reproduces the basic structures of power. In 2021, which was a banner year for VC investment, only 2% of VC dollars went to female-founded companies. 59% of the time, men are paid more for the same jobs in tech than their female counterparts. It feels like we are trying to belong to a system that fundamentally rejects and doesn't respect us. And yet we know, statistically, the research shows that companies with women in leadership positions are quantifiably more profitable. We deserve to be respected and embraced in the workplace. But in order for that to happen, the workplace has to fundamentally change. For me, all the things that people told me were gonna happen at the office happened. I was interrupted, I was overlooked, I felt like people were regularly and casually patronizing me. People always asked me where my children were as if I just left them on the street on my way to work. And yet at the same time, everyone was really nice. Because the sexism in the workplace can sometimes feel almost invisible. It's like that horror movie that you watch where you're not sure if the woman has actually witnessed a murder or if she's just a paranoid alcoholic with the delusions. The thing that I found most confusing were the jokes. 
Whenever someone made a sexist joke at work, I kind of didn't know what to do. I froze, or even worse, I laughed along. And I know as an anthropologist that humor is one of the ways that we most make ourselves belong to a, to a group, to a tribe. And I wanted to belong. As long as I can remember, I've always been torn between wanting to fit in and wanting to be that argumentative person in the room. When I was younger, certainly the argumentative person won out. My parents told me that when I brought home my second grade report card, the teacher had written, Tamima is a very good student, but she talks too much. I was that girl who was always interrupting and asking questions. Because I was raised in a family of activists, my parents were freedom fighters in the Bangladesh War of Independence, and I was raised on a diet of slogans and politics, and they were all for me speaking out. And yet, this was in a cultural context of a lot of rules about what it meant to be a girl. And what it meant to be a girl was to be obedient, to be nice, to be smooth around the edges, literally smooth. A friend of mine's dad refused to let her play tennis with me because he was worried her hands would get too rough. What do we do in contexts like this? How do we respond? In the workplace, I was always the likable person. I was not the argumentative person. It's really hard to be the argumentative person when you're trying to belong. Um, as in preparation for this talk, I asked a lot of people about um, sexist humor in the workplace. And every woman I know has a story. And I'm sure some of you in the audience are thinking back to experiences that you've had. Someone told me that um, when she was very pregnant and about to go on maternity leave, um, her boss called her into the office along with all of her team members and said, well, we're going to have to make a plan for when this one goes on that extended holiday. And everyone laughed, and she laughed too. Sometimes sexist humor makes us complicit, like when a male colleague will joke about his wife in front of us, or he'll say, isn't it great that she doesn't have a job because then she can pick up the kids after work, knowing that you were there at 5 o'clock having a meeting with this person and not picking up your children. Another person told me that she went to an office party where someone brought a blow-up doll, which then proceeded to be mounted and humped. And everyone was clapping along and cheering. And when she got home, she felt ashamed because she had laughed along with everyone else. Because who wants to be that person, the killjoy, the one who just can't take a joke? I'm here to tell you that what you are experiencing is not in your mind. If you feel like you don't belong, if you're not comfortable in the workplace because you're a woman or a person of color or because you arrived at the office by some unconventional means and maybe your accent doesn't sound like everyone else's, there is a reason you don't feel comfortable. There is a reason you are too cold, that you're interrupted, that people ask you to take notes and make coffee. It's because the office was not made for you. We have got to change the system. We have got to get women on boards and on investment committees. We have to fund them when they start businesses. We have to get affordable childcare. We have to close the gender pay gap. We have to normalize working mothers and denormalize sexist language in the workplace. But alongside all of these necessary revolutions, I would like to start a small revolution with you today. I would like to propose that we create space in the workplace by not speaking at all. When I'm in the office and I'm in a meeting, I always feel like I have to enthusiastically respond to what everyone is saying. So if I'm sitting at a meeting and someone is talking, I'm nodding, I'm saying, uh-huh. I'm sort of providing this like social lubricant for everyone to make them feel comfortable. I can't just sit in silence. I guess it's because silence to me has always gone hand in hand with injustice. I believe deeply in the power of speaking out, just like my parents did when they liberated their country. But in a context in which we feel excluded, when the workplace, seemingly innocuously, is hostile to us, women can wield silence as a powerful tool. I also want to resurrect a very sexist trope, and that is the resting bitch face. This, this, 
This was a secret title of my talk when I was writing it, which is The Power of Resting Bitch Face. Now, resting bitch face is the face that we are told we have when we are not trying really hard to look happy or smiley or nice or smooth. They've even done studies to show that some women are born with resting bitch face. So yeah, they have. Um, suggesting that perhaps these women should smile more or maybe even get surgery. I have a friend whose boss repeatedly tells her she has an undiplomatic face. Women want to be respected in the workplace, but we work really hard to be likable because we have been given the message that in order to get ahead in the workplace, we have to adapt to a culture that already exists. But I would like us to challenge that. So here's what I did. Okay, ready? It's called stillness, holding, and waiting. The first thing I did is I stopped nodding in meetings it seems like a really small thing, but I would be in a meeting and I would just hold myself like a statue and not give anything away in my face. The second thing is, when there was an awkward silence in the room, I would hold the silence instead of feeling obliged to fill the silence. And the third thing is called waiting. I decided that when anyone asked me a question, I would wait three seconds before I answered it. So, ask me a question. It feels like a really long time, <laughs> excruciatingly long. We have been told again and again about the power of silence as individuals. M practices like meditation that can help us to focus, that can give us greater clarity, that can help us to overcome our challenges. But what about social silence? Can we wield social silence in a context in which we feel is hostile and alien to us? Perhaps the way to combat language is not to use language at all. Here's what happened to me. When I was still, people asked me what I thought more often. I was still in resting bitch face. I was not giving anything away. I was not being the social lubricant and making everybody else feel good about what they were saying. So they would turn to me and ask me for my opinion. When I held silence, I relinquished my sense of responsibility for always filling awkward silences. I let people come to me. I didn't feel responsible for always going to them. And the third thing, waiting, which was my favorite, it was really effective when I heard a sexist joke in the workplace. I didn't feel like I had to have a really quick retort because sometimes it's really hard to know what to do in the moment. I just sat there in silence and I didn't laugh. I let the joke sit between us like a bad smell. So women, we are not laughing anymore. When they use our bodies for a casual joke, when they tell us our maternity leave is a holiday, when they make fun of their wives in front of us, we are not laughing. We are holding the silence in stillness and power. Because maybe, just maybe, in that stillness and in that silence, they will hear the meaning of their words for the first time. The workplace has been a breeding ground for casual misogyny for too long. I want us to embrace our colleagues with undiplomatic faces. I want us to respect them for being competent people that add value to our organizations, not just the nice ones that help us feel better about ourselves. And I want you to go home and practice your best resting bitch face in the mirror. Get used to seeing your face when it's not trying to please other people, when it's just neutral. I want us to, in the silence, make more oxygen for everyone. And to inspire you in your resting bitch face, I have an image of what I consider some of the best resting bitch faces in history. These women have dazzled us with their power, with their intellect, with their art, yet none of them felt compelled to smile. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.